My name is Tamid Tureen, and today I'll be presenting on our research uh, titled Estimated Player Impact, or EPI, uh, with the subtitle being Quantifying the Effects of Individual Football uh, Players on Football Actions Using Hierarchical Statistical Models. It's a pretty long title, but cool. All right, so Mo already kind of mentioned, but brief introduction by myself. My name is Tamid Tureen, and I'm here as an independent researcher. I don't have any affiliation to any research lab. Um, just here with a personal project. I am, however, professionally a data scientist in the US, and I have a bachelor's in statistics and a master's in biostats, uh, both from the University of Michigan. I'm a huge American college football fan, as well as a huge European football fan. Here's a picture of me with three of my childhood friends after we beat our biggest rivals in American football last year. It's a very emotional moment in my life. Cool, so our motivation for, for our research actually has two points. The first one uh, arises from the expected goals metric or any of the advanced metrics. So I'm, I'm assuming everyone here knows what expected goals are or XG. So just a very quick refresher. It's uh, basically a probabilistic measure that ranges from zero to one. It quantifies uh, the measure of chance quality estimated for any given shot based on a set of shot predictors or characteristics, right? So things like distance to goal, um, angle of the shot, uh, shot type. Uh, however, from a statistical point of view, we uh, interpret it as an expected value. So if you see an XG such as 0 0.10, you interpret it as you know, an average player is expected to score that shot 10% of the time if it was repeated uh, multiple times. It allows statisticians and analysts like myself to re retrospectively and mathematically assess the quality of chances created by a team and specifically the quality of chances that are taken by a specific player. What's really interesting about XG though is that, is that it doesn't have a player predictor. There isn't like a player characteristic in the model. So what that means is that if you have two shots that have the same exact um, model predictors in the model, you would have the same exact XG for those two shots, right? So you may have two inherently different players, uh, but the model will still output the same XG if the model predictors are the same. So it won't be able to differentiate between a forward like Mohamed Salah and a center back like Virgil van Dijk. And actually, as a matter of fact, it wouldn't be able to differentiate between a goalkeeper like Allison, who has that one shot and then one, one header goal, right? So this is our first primary uh, motivation as to why we're doing this research. The second point of our motivation actually arises from the data that we're working with, which is the football event level data, right? I think everyone here is familiar with that. So the events in football event level data refer to football actions, such as shots, passes, dribbles, tackles, and whatnot. And each of these events have associated characteristics like shot type, um, shot angle, shot location, and whatnot. Uh, and you know, it's, we know that any player during a match can take multiple actions. And because they take multiple actions over the course of a match, they, might, they will definitely show up more than once in the data set. So from the point of view of a statistician, what we refer to this is as, uh, we refer to this as uh, repeated measures data. It's longitudinal data collected over a period of time. So here is a visual of what that looks like. Uh, this is from Brighton's 4-0 win over Man United last season. So here, Danny Welbeck had four shots, Mark Cucurella had two, Fernandez had three, and then Edinson Cavani had one, right? So when you have repeated measures data, what you end up with in the data itself is a data hierarchy, which is you know, visualized in this diagram here. So all those observations or data points are actually nested under a player because the player itself is generating that data, right? So because of this, the way that we can view the data is that there are clusters of data within the full data set. So, because of that, um, all the shots that belong to Danny Welbeck are actually correlated with each other because there's an influence from Danny Welbeck on the shot, right? We expect him to have his own approach to the shot, his own approach to you know, how, how he deals with uh, pressure and whatnot, and same for Mark Cucurella and the other two players on this diagram. This fundamentally violates one of the fundamental assumptions in statistics, which is that all observations in modeling data are independent of each other. Inside your data set now, you have groups or clusters of data points that are correlated with each other, 
which are no longer independent of each other. And this is a very interesting nuanced detail with event level football data. So here, if I break down Mark Cucurella's uh, data from you know, real stats bomb data here, you can see a more visual uh, representation of the nested hierarchy or the data hierarchy. So the top level, you have Mark Cucurella, and then you have his two shots. And then if you break it down even more, you have the uh, characteristics about the shot. So this is the event level data. At a higher level, there's the grouped information, right? And because of this data hierarchy, what we can actually do is we can use a specific set of models to basically learn patterns about just Mark Cucurella because inside the data, there's a subsample of data just for Mark Cucurella. And the same thing for like Edinson Cavani or Bruno Fernandez or Danny Welbeck. So this is where you know, we get our primary motivation behind our work. There is a Cucurella impact or a Cucurella influence inside the data or patterns inside the data about the player that comes from the subsample that's within the whole data set. So we previously discussed that each football player has their own approach to a football action, right? So it is reasonable to assume, assume that Cucurella will have a different influence on a shot conversion as opposed to Mohamed Salah. So what is interesting here, however, is that the shots that are correlated for Cucurella are actually independent of Salah, right? Because Salah has no influence on the shots that Cucurella took. So you have a full data set with information about a bunch of players, but inside the data sets, you have subsamples of data that you can analyze as you're analyzing, analyzing the whole data set. So using those ideas, we frame our research uh, questions here. So to first address the data hierarchy and the repeated measures or in the correlation in the data, we propose the use of statistical hierarchical models. These are called hierarchical or multi-level because one, the data that you're working with has a hierarchical structure as, as demonstrated by that diagram earlier and the model parameters in the data set have a hierarchy as well. And motivated by the aforementioned challenges and discussion points, we frame three research questions or research aims. The first one is develop an XG model that we can use to basically estimate XG for, for every single shot in our event level data. And then two, estimate the effects of each player and calculate player specific XG values for each shot. So this will now allow us to differentiate between the shots uh, for players that have the same model predictors, but obviously the players are different. And finally, we wanna create uh, generalizable in, or draw generalized inferences from our models. So basically develop interpretable models. The proposed model is called the Generalized Linear Mixed Model. I think maybe some of you have already heard of this model. Uh, and for the purpose of this presentation, we're only gonna focus on the second point here, which is the player-adjusted XG, right? One and three will be are discussed in more detail in the paper, and actually more details about part two is also discussed in the paper. So if you're interested in all these, definitely check out our paper. Cool, so we're gonna dive into results, but before that, let me give you guys all like background information about our work. So first, we were given data by StatsBomb for the English Premier League, or, or the PL. Uh, we got 580 matches from the 2021 and 21 seasons, or 21, 22 seasons, and the WSL, so 326 matches from the 18, 19, 19, 20, and then 2021 20, seasons. Cool, and before our analysis, we actually filtered our data set for open play shots, so we dropped penalty and direct free kicks because they come directly from a dead ball situation. And we also drop observations from the data that were missing relevant information like goalkeeper location and whatnot. Cool, so here's the breakdown of the data samples. So you, you know, from the Premier League, we have uh, almost 14,000 shots, and from the WSL, we have uh, 7,928, so less data for the WSL, but the distribution of goals are almost the same, like 10% to 11% and there's more players in the Premier League as opposed to WSL even though we're using more seasons worth of data. Okay, a uh, little bit of background about the model predictors we used in our analysis. So we used four continuous predictors, uh, shot taker's distance to goal, goalkeeper's distance to goal, angle of the shot triangle, so the shot angle, and the shot impact height, which is a stats bomb variable, so it measures the height of the pass received before the shot and six binary predictors, uh, first time shot, goalkeeper's presence in the shot triangle, so in line of the shot, 
one-on-one -on -one shot, open goal shot, side of the pitch from the shot taker's perspective, and shot taker under pressure. Two multi-class predictors, the body part you use to take your the shot, and then finally uh, shot technique, and then one count predictor, which is just the number of defenders that are in the shot triangle or in the line of shot. Cool, and here's some footnotes. Cool, okay. So now we're gonna talk about the math. Uh, I'll keep it very, very high level, but we're gonna introduce the player adjusted XG models. So the response variable is goal, and we know, or yes, no, like binary variable, and we also know that the current set of XG models are not hierarchical, so they don't adjust for that correlation that I mentioned earlier. Uh, here, we propose a generalized linear mix model, which actually will adjust for that correlation or within player correlation. And the particular model that we're using in this research is called a random effects model, and what we have here are random player effects. And, right, so I'm sure you've heard of the GLM, or logistic regression. It's basically an extension of that model. You just add another parameter in the model to push it up to another hierarchy in the analysis. Cool, so here in this equation, you don't have to know what's going on really, but the X's are the predictors, the betas are the relationships between the target and the predictors, and what's, what's important here is that delta J parameter, which represents the cluster or the groups in the data set, so the player, player groups or player clusters. And because now we added this new parameter into our model, the model can actually learn not only information about the predictors and their effects on the XG or the target, it can also learn information about the, the patterns within the subsamples in the data and quantify it for delta J, and the J represents the player index, right? So here, like easy math, right? If, if delta J is greater than zero, it's a positive contribution because it would increase the value of this summation, and if it's less than zero, it's a negative contribution. So for players, if you have a positive value, you view it as someone who inherently increases the odds of scoring a goal. Negative is someone who would decrease the odds of goal. Cool, so now let's talk about our model results. So the EPI measures, so expected player impact. So this is the, the delta J that I was talking about. We just coined it this just to make it more football friendly. Uh, but in statistics, it would be called a random effect. Cool, so these are directly derived from the GLMMs, uh, and the values here only represent contribution to XG, so you can't, once I show you the rankings, don't think that one player is better than the other player, it's only in the, the scope or focus of just XG models. And once we had the models developed, we stratified it in terms of rankings for four position groups, and we built our models for the WSL and the Premier League separately. So they're only comparable within their models. They're not comparable across models. Cool, so is anyone interested in taking a couple guesses on who the top five forwards would be from either the Premier League or the WSL? Son, okay. Another one? Kane, okay, great. Okay, so here are the rankings. So at uh, the top, we have you know, the headers, so the EPI is the random effect, the SD represents the uncertainty, and the goals, shots, right, and then SBXG is actually the StatsBomb XG for each player as provided by StatsBomb. I think this is before the new update. So in almost all of these, you can see that there is an overperformance in XG, which is expected from players who are overperforming, or are good at scoring goals. So, no surprise to anyone, uh, Hyun Min Son is number one. What is interesting though is seeing Gareth Bale and Marcus Rashford here because both of them receive a lot of criticism from pundits in general. And Ilka Gundogan shouldn't be a huge surprise and Riyad Mahrez is, is an interesting one. As for the WSL, uh, what's really interesting to point out is that G is tied with Vivian Miedema. I think if you watch the WSL, Vivian Miedema is not a surprising entry. I, I personally thought she was gonna be outright number one, but it looks like there's a tie between G and Miedema, which is very interesting. Here are the midfielders. Uh, James Madison is ranked number one. It's actually very interesting because he did score a really good goal this weekend in that Tottenham game. Uh, I expected De Bruyne to be number one, but it's very cool to see James Madison, someone from outside the big six, top six, uh, be in these rankings. 
Uh, interesting entry, Emil Smith-Rowe, uh, especially because he no longer really starts for Arsenal, so it would be really interesting to see how Arteta uses him this season because he does seem to be a very, very interesting candidate here. And the WSL, I think we all me will me mention earlier that you know, it's mostly dominated by Arsenal, Chelsea, and City, so no surprise that there's two Arsenal players and one Chelsea player tied for, tied for first. Center backs, uh, at the top we have Kurt Zuma. Uh, I think if you watch Chelsea under Frank Lampard, you'll remember some of his incredible goals from set pieces. Thiago Silva, Gabriel from Arsenal, interesting entries. <laughs> I did not expect Michael Keane on here. Um, I would like to hear some Everton fans' opinion on that. Um, and for the WSL, what's really interesting in the WSL rankings here is that the EPIs here are very close to zero for the center backs. I think it's because there's not enough data samples for the WSL defenders, right? You can see that there's only like 16 shots for the top player and then just one shot for the fifth best defender in terms of XG. And another thing is that in the WSL, there are more players categorized as defenders and midfielders and wing backs, so they show up on multiple rankings. Here are fullbacks, Stuart Dallas, interesting entry for me personally. Um, what's not interesting, or what's not surprising is the entries of Ben Chilwa and Reese James. I think Reese James, uh, last season, Thomas Tuchel was the, the Chelsea coach and he really likes playing with inverted wing backs. So these, these two players are not surprise entries. Sergi Canos and Matty Cash, are very cool uh, entries here in my opinion. And then here are the rankings for the WSL as well. I think Georgia Stanway moved to the Bundesliga this season. Cool, and goalkeepers, there's only one right answer. 100% shot conversion. Cool, okay, so now how do we use these EPIs, right? Like how would a football analyst use this? Let's stop talking about like statistics. How would you use it in the world of football? So we used, we have three case studies. The first one is a retrospective analysis of player transfers. So Imagine we're in like a crazy universe, right, where Daniel Levy was like, you know what, I'll let Son leave and, and go to City, right? So here, hypothetical, Son is going to City and then Riyad Mahrez is moving the other direction. Uh, what you can do is you can use these models to basically look at the shots that were taken by Son in the past, the shots that were taken by Riyad Mahrez in the past, and basically substitute their EPI and get like a proxy estimate of whether or not they would have improved the XGs from last season with, with a you know, increase or decrease or what is the little breakdown of that, right? So here's how I did it. I uh, looked at, Son, or at Tottenham, Son took 151 shots and I just substituted it and I see that in terms of total XG, uh, Riyad Mahrez would decrease the XG and actually for XG per shot, it would go down by 0.03 uh, and whereas in, in, the, in City, uh, at City, uh, I substituted uh, Son's EPI in for Mahrez's shots, and I can see that there's an improvement, and uh, there is an improvement per shot by 0.03 uh, EPI units. Right here's another breakdown. You can see that you know Son improves a lot of a lot of the XG categories, whereas you know he decreases low probability shots, but increases high probability shots, except for the very high, greater than 0.3 XG shots. Here's Mahrez at Tottenham, uh, he would, you know, it would be like not an improvement uh, for Tottenham to lose Son. I think that goes without saying. What's interesting though here is that you can do this kind of analysis for similar players like, for example, if you're an analyst at Chelsea, you could have evaluated the Obama Yang transfer beforehand or the Sterling transfer beforehand. If you're interested about those results, I can talk about it um, later with you at the networking sessions. Another thing you can do, uh, I think you know, in XG it's, it's not, uh, it's very commonplace, is opposition scouting. So right, it, it, assume you're an analyst for the women's team at City, you could model uh, results using SASBOM event data to then find what the EPIs are for Chelsea's opposition, or Chelsea's forward players, and here, you know, rank them by the EPI and see like which players are the highest threat, like you don't want these players to be able to take a shot in front of goal, uh, so here, you know, G, Frank Kirby, and Sam Kerr are the top three. There are some ties, however, 
and Aaron Cuthbert and Gurwright actually have negative effects, but they're really close to zero. And obviously, you know, you, you can look back at your old, old matches and see like which players did you give up goals to, which players did you give up uh, shots to. And by using that, you can you know, better prepare or help the coaching staff better prepare for, for the next match. Here are, the, here are the goals. All right, finally, if you're an analyst at a club you know, and you, you're interested in like, evaluating your players over time, what you can do is you can actually create GLMM models that are stratified by the season. So here we have two seasons worth of uh, uh, the Premier League data. So I created a 2021 season's uh, data or model and then a 21-22 season's uh, model. I don't know why that arrow is doing that. But uh, on the right, on the bottom, is the 2020-21 season's model. And on the y-axis, you have the 2021-22 uh, season's model. So in the top right-hand quadrant, it's players who positively contribute to XG for both seasons. The bottom right corner is players who have declined in terms of contribution to XG. And on the bottom left are players who negatively have contributed to both seasons, so it showed no improvement, actually just stayed bad, um, negative contribution. And then this side, or the top left, would be players who improved from the previous season in terms of EPI or XG contribution. So, top quadrant, right, we have <laughs> Hyun Min Song, a crazy outlier over there. And then you have some of these players here. Um, Right, uh, I think Jack Harrison, that's an interesting entry. He, didn't, he wasn't in the top five, but he's here. He definitely deviates away from the average in the middle. Here are the players who showed improvement from the previous season. I think Kevin De Bruyne, this is an interesting case because the 2020-21 season is the COVID season, the lockdown season, uh, and he was injured. So it, it captures that you know, once he came back, full, like fully fit his improvement. Uh, the Reese James entry here is not surprising, right? Again, like Tuchel likes playing inverted wingbacks, so he, he contributed more to goals. It looks like Jamie Vardy and Neil Mope had an improvement from the previous lockdown season. Here are the players who showed decline. Uh, Stuart Dallas, who was number one in our wingback rankings, right? But like in, in the previous season, once he moved to the next season, he showed some uh, decline. And here are some Arsenal players who are no longer at Arsenal. Uh, who showed decline, and Dominic Calvert-Lewin uh, also showed a decline. These are very interesting findings, right? And here are the unfortunate uh, candidates for negative contribution both seasons. I think Timo Werner, that's very unfortunate, but yeah, he had a very tough time in the Premier League. He was the worst player in terms of XG contribution in our models. And what's interesting, though, is Bobby Firmino here. Uh, it shows that he's very close to the zero line for the 21-22 season, so he's improving back up. Here's just the holistic view. Right, so discussion and future steps. Uh, in this research, we, we proposed a very principled uh, approach to analyzing event data, right? We first broke down the structure of the data set, you know, and then like the statistical principles, statistical characteristics of the data set, and then we uh, propose an appropriate model to address for those statistical issues to basically create an XG model. And by doing so, we're able to create a player-adjusted XG model, so now you can actually differentiate between players and XG, and not every single shot will get the same XG, you know, so you can, maybe you can do an analysis like Messi versus Ronaldo, finally. And, uh, right, the player impacts are interpretable, and, uh, the models were stratified for the WSL and the Premier League, so they're within, within league uh, comparisons. So what would be interesting to see is if you, if you build an entire model using the top five leagues and where those rankings are. I think Erling Holland would probably be number one, maybe number two. Cool, and then all the ideas that we presented here are actually, you know, they're not just applicable to XG, right? As long as you have a specific type of target variable, you can create these player-adjusted models for any, any metric like uh, XA, expected assists, XT, expected threat, uh, as well as packing. I think it's a very popular metric in Germany. Uh, and one last note is that 
the GLMM is a very, you know, it's one of the first hierarchical models that we propose here. There's actually multiple other ways to model hierarchical data. Uh, this is a frequentist approach. You can uh, explore a Bayesian approach alternative. Additionally, um, you can actually add uh, player variability in the, the betas in the equation too. So if, as you increase shot angle, does that increase or decrease uh, XG for certain players? All right, here's some acknowledgments. Uh, Sigurd Altov uh, collaborated on this project. Uh, Matt Zavisovsky, he, was, uh, he gave me great advice on our work, gave me review, uh, feedback on the statistical models, and obviously uh, Will Morgan and Katie Slade for helping me prepare for this conference. All right, here's my contact information for people who are interested in reaching out. Awesome, thank you so much. Right, thanks very much. Um, I think my, we might have time for maybe two or three questions. Right. Hi, uh, great presentation. Thank you. I enjoyed A couple of questions. One, uh, the EPI for the women league, uh, the forward and the midfield, mm -hmm. is, seems to be lower than for the men. Mm -hmm. Is it a statistical comparison because of the data? And the other question is, uh, the EPI, you give the standard deviation. In uh, many cases, I would think it would go over the zero, mm. which means that what's your statistical sort of strength in terms of predicting this if you don't have a 95% a, a or maybe a 75% confidence? Yep. Yeah, great questions. Uh, addressing the first question, I believe the, the WSL EPIs are so low, so close to the zeros is because one, the data samples, we might, you know, we just don't have a lot of shots for some of the players. Some of the players have a lot of shots, like Miedema has a lot of shots. So that's one. Uh, second thing is maybe, you know, this is hypothetical, or it's a hypothesis, maybe there isn't a lot of variability in the WSL in terms of shots that are being taken. So maybe a lot of the forwards and center backs and whatnot are very similar in terms of the the type of goals that they're scoring. Whereas in the EP, or the Premier League, we saw more variability. There's more players that are like outliers, like Madison for midfielders and Son for forwards or wingers. The second question, uh, the uncertainty measure, that's a great, great question. So that is actually impacted, again, by the data sample. So how much variability you have in the data. Secondly, the selection of predictors would also matter. So here, we didn't spend a lot of time doing variable selection and like really identifying predictors. We just kind of did literature review and picked one, picked ones that we thought were relevant. Uh, adding like spurious model predictors can add a lot of noise to the model, which can affect the random effect derivation, which is why we, we might see large standard deviations in the random effect. Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Right, any other questions? Um, how much correlation is there between the value that you've sort of come up with um, through the model and just looking at sort of goals minus expected goals um, adjusted for time? Because um, we both we know both De Bruyne and Son are massive overperformers in mm -hmm. terms of goals minus expected goals as we currently look at it. Great question. Uh, so I don't have a visual to show you, but when you look at these rankings, what you'll notice is you know, overperformance in the stats bomb XG, right? Uh, what is interesting though, here I only showed you five, but if, if I showed you the whole data set, you'll see some players that are actually underperforming their XG, but their EPIs are still positive. So it's very interesting to see that um, we didn't really get a lot of time to spend, figure out like why that is going on, but yeah, like that, again, is like a next step, like future step for someone else to explore or for me to explore. Thank you. Thank you.